Okay, so we are going to be in Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. We've been following the life of Paul and we're getting near. We have one more chapter left in the book of Acts and a journey that we have started back in February. Um, and so it's been quite the journey of seeing how the Holy Spirit came, the church was born, Paul, Peter were kind of talking about Jesus and just spreading. Now the, the word of God is getting spread everywhere and, and people are, are, huh? Oh yeah. And yeah. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, and so, so that's where we are in the book of Acts chapter 27. And we're going to see, like I said today, Paul's most dangerous moments are in this chapter. Um, he's had some really rough times. He's suffered a lot in his life, being whipped and beaten for just believing in Jesus. But today, he's going to stare death right in the face. Uh, before we get to that, though, I do want to share um, what happened this past Monday as a group of us um, gathered and we went up to um, Belize City and we partnered with a group named uh, Belize Camping Adventure. and uh, Experience, that's right. Belize Camping Experience, right. And, um, and so they um, are an organization that loves the Lord. And what they do is they get local Belizeans and they come to their property and they have homes built there where people can stay, a cafeteria where they can eat. And they will train them to go out into the city and do things like vacation Bible schools and teach children and teach people. And, um, and so they have a heart for the Lord. And um, it was awesome to see uh, what they're doing and impacting the lives of people up there in Belize City. But two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, they were four foot underwater because of the hurricane turning north and hitting them. And so um, we're going to show some pictures up here. And I'm going to just say anybody that went on the trip that wants to share just a, a, a brief couple sentences or, or you know, a little bit about uh, what they did up there, you're welcome to. We've got this red, uh, this is the red mic, just in case. Um, but the mic is here. You guys can c come jump up and, um, you know, or, or just say it from where you're at. Um, but uh, let's go ahead with the pictures up here. It's in uh, the mission trip pictures over here. Yeah, mission trip pics. Yeah. All right, so it might take a second for the pictures to load up there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to stand to the side. Okay, I'll stand to the side so you guys can see. But if I stand here, yeah, I can't do that. So how about I sit down? All right. Yeah, I'll sit down. Okay, so here's our group. We had about 14 of us heading up there. Um, and uh, we took off on Monday morning. Go ahead, next one. Um, this, is, um, this is their um, their main, yeah, their main vehicles to get around and part of their property and um, and so we, we left here, um, prayed before we go, right? And, uh, and so these are some of the houses that they have up there. Um, they're right near the place, and if you're familiar with Belize City, right past Old Belize. Um, you know, so if you're familiar with it. All right, next one. So this is looking out at the back of their property, and you can see the Caribbean right there. So all that storm surge, four foot of it came. And, um, and, and they were underwater. They got a lot of the main things up uh, to salvage that. And um, so, yeah, but um, this, imagine, four foot high of water. Um, and so this is, this is um, where we started our day. Um, and so we even had some of our guys walking on water. That was pretty cool. And, and they got closer, too. Yep, uh, next one. Yep, and climbing some trees, got to do that. And then, let's see. All right, so this was one of our projects, and our project leader on this was Kai, right? You guys were up on top of this, um, securing the uh, tent, the canvas, the tarp that was up there. Uh, that came off, and they used this space for offices. Uh, and, and so this is one of their main offices. And so for them to be able to secure that, I think we have a picture next one is... Yep, this is his crew up on top of there. And God really protected us because, I mean, you had to be stepping right in the right spots in order to fix that. Um, and so God really watched over them as they were helping secure that tarp up top there. Um, Eli, Eli, you want to share a little bit what happened here? Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. There's some swamp, you can see right behind his right shoulder there. Um, so a lot of mosquitoes are in that area. And uh, so the, it was really good to get that screen back up, fixed up there for him. Uh, so people could eat there without mosquitoes. So, yep. And then we have Miss Julie. She helped uh, make lunch for us and our team. And uh, they got a great cafeteria there to, to help feed a bunch of people. And um, so thanks for her, her work as well up there. And yes. And then... Uh, then we had a, a, a good project with, uh, who were who the wood, the lumber guys? Raise your hand. Yeah, Johnny. Yeah, he was our leader on that one. Harrison, yeah, and who? Joshua. Yeah, Micah helped some lumber. Braden. Yeah. Adrian. Yeah. So some of these guys, they were all helping. What, what they did is they had lumber uh, that, that's been donated by people. And then they took and they loaded up. Go ahead, next picture. Um, you'll see these guys loading it up into the back of a van. Um, yeah, look at all that wood. They, they piled it high. And then we went and delivered two truckloads of that to um, a place that we're going to see in just a moment. But, um, uh, but, but they were all working hard, you know, really, really manual labor. So this is where we delivered it. This is a place in Belize City called the Swamp. People know the Swamp up there. If you're homeless, you go to the Swamp. Uh, it's a village, a community that's built up, again, off the swamp waters. Um, and so you have to, um, you'll see in just a moment, here we are unloading it. Um, keep going. Yep, lots of wood. And some of the wood was actually um, available to go to the church. Um, but look, you'll see, they have to put these wood pallets and, and wood pieces down even to just walk through the community and the village. And so, um, so some of the parts uh, of, you know, of the pathway uh, was rotten wood. So as we're taking this lumber back, we we're even making a walkway even better. But then the lumber would get back to certain homes. We had two homes that actually did not have a roof. The roof was completely gone. And so we were delivering this wood to them. Uh, so you keep going, there's, there's some of the crew. You can kind of see the swampy water as we give, and this, this goes back for miles um, in, in houses that we didn't even get to see. But you can see some of the pallets that are broken. Um, you can see some of the hurricane kind of damage a little bit, looks like. Next. Yep, keep going. All right, this is one of the houses that didn't have the roof anymore. Matter of fact, it had a zinc roof, and because of the hurricane, the zinc roof fell off into the swampy water below. I think we have another picture here soon. Um, it may have been back further. We might have passed it. Yeah, this one right here. So you can actually see the roof from that house is right here in the water. The zinc fell off. And I, I said, well, why don't we just grab the zinc out of that water? We'll put it back up there, right? He said, no, 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 because right near that zinc, there's about a seven-foot crocodile. So they're living completely over croc infested waters as, as they're living in their homes. And so, um, and then we had that one last picture, right? The, uh, the other house. Oh, this is the church that they had up there in the middle of this community. So we got to pray there for them. And, um, and then the, the team, this is the rest of the property uh, there on site. So they were uh, Leah and... Um, Alexander, yes, Alexander and Leah are, are is the couple that um, man, manage this uh, ministry, and and they were just so grateful to have us, and uh, and we just want to thank the church uh, for being able to send us up there, and um, and so uh, so the tithes and offerings you give that helps pay for the gas money, um, it helped to give them a little bit of money for them to provide our lunch up there, and so without our church we can't go. Um, and so that's what's amazing about uh, our tithes and offerings are, are you know, just uh, doing ministry work. And, uh, and so that was a, a great time. Anybody have anything they want to say from the team uh, about that trip, how it impacted you?
That's right. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else want to share? That is, God just has the right people, the skill sets, the every, everything. It was just neat to see how God used each and every one of our skills to, to meet a need that they had. Uh, so it was really, really uh, special and impactful. Anybody else? Just like that verse, the memory verse for last week, I'm, I'm telling you, these memory verses set us up for something ahead in our week. Um, and, and that verse last, we don't preach ourselves, right? We preach about Jesus. And that's what we were able to do even from here going out. And so as the Lord brings up things and opportunities, we just have to be willing to say, I'm ready to go, Lord. You just tell me what to do and, and what to say, uh, even in those times. So. Um, just really grateful to be able to have that, that chance. And again, like, like Alex said, hopefully the first of many. So, all right, in Acts chapter 27, that's where we are today. Um, we want to look at last week's central idea for us was just as God guides Paul's life, he also guides yours. And so every step of the way, God can guide us. We just have to submit and surrender to his plans and so th today, though, today, our central idea is this right here. Paul's life is filled with occasions when God helped him through difficult times. Um, and again, anything that comes up on the screen, if you want to pop a picture with your phone, I'll know you're not taking a picture of me. I'll know it's that. So, yeah. All right. So you feel free to take a picture of what's up on the screen so that you can use it maybe throughout your week. Um, if, if there's a, a point or something up there that, that you want to take a picture of. Um, anybody know the Doña Paz? The Doña Paz. I didn't know it until last night either. Um, but I found the Doña Paz was a ship. It was a ship over in the Philippines. Now, if you don't know where the Philippines is, I've got a map up here. I want to show you where we're talking about here, okay? So now here's the big nation of China, and then we've got India off to the west over here, and then we got Korea and Japan coming down. Where's Japan? There's Japan over here. And then way down here, I'm kind of standing in front of it here, here is the Philippines, all right? So let's zoom in to the Philippines, next picture. And here we're gonna zoom in, all right? The Philippines is a series of islands. All right, and so I want you to see this right here. There's a, a city way down in this corner, and this ship was actually going to be going way up to the very top corner of Manila. And this ship, right about in here, off of this island right here, I can't even pronounce the name of that island, but right in here, this ship collided with another ship. And I don't know if you know this, but it is the worst sea-going tragedy, the loss of life ever in history. They, this ship only was able, should have been only carrying 1,518 passengers. 
but they crammed as many people as they could. It was a ferry boat, so it was a passenger boat. They were just trying to transport people back and forth. But when these two ships collided, it caused the worst loss of life on our seas in human history. And so the Doña Paz, here's a picture of the, the, the boat, the Doña Paz, before it left in 1987. And on that day, December 20th, we wouldn't realize that so many people would die. God is giving, as we're going through Acts, God is giving Paul opportunities to speak to important government leaders, even King Agrippa. And over and over, Paul is sharing the story of how he met Jesus. But guess what? Sometimes people will listen and they will believe. But then other times, people don't want to hear it. They don't want to listen to anything. We're going to talk about storms. We're going to talk about difficult journeys today. Difficult journeys in our life. Um, maybe you know of somebody that, that has suffered an illness or uh, undergone a terrible loss. Or, but maybe you know of somebody that's going through that right now. And you could be someone that's the encouragement for them. As we're going to see, Paul goes through a storm, but he becomes the encouragement for the people that are going through the storm. And so storms are going to happen, but how do we respond to it? Let's look in verse 1. What just happened here to Paul? What is going to happen to him that he's actually going to face death and be an encouragement? Well, you, the last time we left Paul, it was decided that he was going to go to Caesar and present his case in the capital of Rome. All right, and so I think we have a map of, of where, what, what this journey is gonna look like for Paul. All right, so Paul is now over here in Caesarea, and this is his last journey. Now look at this red line. This red line is his ship to get to Rome. All right, but as you can see, this is quite interesting. It's a pretty squiggly line, and we'll see why in just a little bit. Um, but he, that's where we left him last week. Now he's about to get ready to go to Rome. So verse 1 says, It was decided that we would sail for Italy. Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a Roman commander named Julius. All right? He belonged to the Imperial Guard. We boarded a ship from Andrimitium, and it was about to sail for ports along the coast of Asia Minor. We headed out to sea. Aristarchus was with us. He was a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we landed at Sidon. There Julius was kind to Paul. All right, so this Julius guy, he's a good guy. All right, he was kind to Paul. He let Paul visit his friends so they could give him what he needed. From there we headed out to sea again. We passed the calmer side of Cyprus because the winds were against us. All right, so do you see Cyprus? There's Cyprus. All right, so they're right here in their journey. The calmer side of Cyprus. All right, follow along on that map because this is giving us detail where they're going. The calmer side of Cyprus because the winds were against us. Verse 5 We sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia. Then we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the commander found a ship from Alexandria sailing for Italy. He put us on board, all right? So this was probably most likely a grain ship, all right, out of this area right here. They caught this bigger ship that probably was transporting grain up onto Italy. And so verse 7, we moved along slowly for many days. We had trouble getting to, I'm going to call it Nidus, all right? You see, uh, there we have Rhodes, right? <laughs> Rhodes, and then we got Nidus is right north of that, and it's going to come, they're going to come down to Crete, all right? So they're in Nidus, um, and the wind did not let us stay on course, so we passed the calmer side of Crete, opposite of Salmon. It was not easy to sail along the coast. Can you, can you identify with that? It's not easy sometimes. Going through life in this journey. It wasn't easy sailing 
along the coast where they were. Then we came to the place called Fair Havens. It was the town of Lacia. A lot of time had passed. Sailing had already become dangerous. By now, it was after the Day of Atonement, a day of fasting. Now, what that means to us, how we can translate that is, it was in about October, okay? And so winter there is like winter kind of north of us, all right? They're kind of in the same latitudinal lines as, uh, as them. So winter is approaching them, okay? Um, and so Paul gave them a warning. Listen to this. Paul gives them a warning. Now, is he a sailor? No. But he's giving them a warning. So you can imagine what these Roman imperial guys and the captains of this ship, how, how much credence they give to Paul. Verse 10, men, he said, I can see that our trip is going to be dangerous. The ship and everything in it will be lost. Our own lives will be in danger also. But the commander didn't listen to what Paul said. Instead, he followed the advice of the pilot and the ship's owner. Now, I, I would probably be doing the same thing, right? If I was the commander of this ship, here's a prisoner trying to tell me, let's stop. I, I'm going to listen to probably the, the, the boat captain, right? I mean, it just makes sense. But Paul tried. Paul tried to warn him. You ever had somebody in your life warn you? And you're like, oh, I should have listened. I should have listened. Right. This was Paul was trying to get through, but he know he knows that his reputation didn't really lend itself to them listening. So the commander didn't listen to what Paul said. Instead, he followed that advice of the pilot of the ship's owner. The harbor, verse 12, wasn't a good place for ships to stay during winter. So most of the people I love this. Watch this now. So most of the people decided we should sail on. You ever listen to the crowd? You ever listen to people that led you in the wrong way? A group of people, a group of friends, maybe got you into trouble? Most of the people decided we should sail on. So they, they hoped we could reach Phoenix. They wanted to spend the winter there. Phoenix was a harbor in Crete. It, fa it faced both southwest and northwest. All right, so now in this, I want you to think about there was a man named Aristarchus. All right, Aristarchus... We, we, we mentioned earlier, it was one of those people with him. But the only details Luke gave us about this man is that he's a Macedonian from Thessalonica. However, Paul also mentions Aristarchus in his letters. Did you know in Colossians 4.10, it says something about Ar Ar Aristarchus being a fellow prisoner of his. So they were, they were jailmates, this Aristarchus. And then he wrote that Aristarchus was his fellow worker in the book of Philemon. The two men, they seemed to have a long history together. And God was kind enough to send this faithful man to support Paul during this difficult journey. You ever had somebody that you just were so thankful for when you were walking through a tough time? A, a trial in your life, a struggle in your life. And you can think of that one person even right now. You can think of their name. I'm like, thank you, Lord, for that that person. That was Aristarchus for Paul in this trial, in this storm. I want you to, I want you to take notice on that. God uses, okay, people. God uses people to give us warnings. All right. I, I want you to think about in life, who are the people that give you warnings? Um, I, I'll give you an example. You guys think of this, uh, think of one. But like on Coastal Road, when you're coming and approaching the, the, the construction workers, you got these guys standing there, like maybe with flags, or going like this, slow down, right? There's people in our lives that give us warnings. Can you think of any other people in, in our lives that give us warnings out and about everyday life? Can you think of any? It's okay. Shout it out. Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Our elders, yeah. Parents, uh-huh. Yeah. What is it? Anyone? Anyone? Teachers, yeah. Teachers, yeah. Yeah, God gives us people in our lives to give us warnings. And that's, that's the favor of God looking out for us sometimes. But sometimes we don't want to listen. See, our, our tendency, we tend 
to actually hear what we want to hear and do what we want to do. Isn't that true? Yeah. We will ignore advice sometimes because that's our natural way. Our natural way is to just go, oh, I got this. Yeah, I can do this. I'm, I'm, I'm capable. I'm smart. Right? If we take somebody else's advice, it means we're not sm as smart as them. Right? You know, we can make excuses, but sometimes that's our tendency is to hear what we want to hear and do what we want to do. And then the last, the last thing that I get from this section of Scripture is following the crowd isn't always the best thing to do. <laughs> following the crowd, the crowd can get you in trouble. And, 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 and this whole crowd on the boat, and we're going to see how many people were on this boat in a little while, but there's a lot of people on this boat, and they all were like, most of the people decided, let's go on. Come on, let's go. Paul's thinking, oh man, now we're in it, right? We're going to be in a mess. So, Let's go to the next section. Here comes the storm. All right. Now, something about a storm, I was just sharing with a praise man earlier that you're either in the storm, okay, you're coming out of one, or you're about to head into one, right? So you're, you're in one of three places, okay? It's just the fact. You're either in the storm, you're coming, just came out of the storm, or you're about to head into one, all right? So now, does that cause us to be fearful? No, we don't have to be fearful. We're going to see that in just a little while. We don't have to be fearful. All right, but that's the thing about storms. And, and what did our memory verse say? He is a place of safety for us. He gives us strength, right? He does that. He gives us strength, right? Hey, high five. You want to share some plantains with me, don't you? Oh my goodness. No, she's like, I'm not sharing. I'm not sharing. These are good plantains. Um, and so the storm is, is, it could be approaching. All right, so let's look at verse 13. A gentle south wind began to blow. They thought this was what they had been waiting for. So they pulled up the anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Now, you remember where Titus was? Titus, a good friend of Paul. He was in Crete. All right, so even in this this country that they're passing, this island that they're passing, he has friends. He has friends there. And I'm like, man, Paul was probably like, man, if I can stay in Crete, maybe I can spend some time with Titus. But they didn't, they didn't actually get off there um, to be able to spend time with Titus. So here, here it is in Crete. They, they pass along the shore of Crete. Verse 14. Before very long, a wind blew down from the island. It had the force of what? A hurricane. Now, all right, so now that steps it up a notch. I want you guys to realize how dangerous this is. They're in a boat, and they're off the coast, and a hurricane comes. All right, so you, you got to understand, this was called a northeaster. All right, so this is, a, this is a bad storm. And the ship was caught by the storm. All right, now they're in it. All right, we couldn't even keep sailing into the wind. So what? We gave up. We gave up and we were just being driven along. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like life is just driving you along and you can't do anything? I mean, this is what their ship was going through. They, they gave up trying to fight against this storm. And we, then we passed, verse 16, we passed the calmer side of a small island called Cauda. We almost lost the lifeboat. So the men lifted the lifeboat on board. Then they tied ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Can you imagine? How, how would you like to be the How I don't even know how they did that, but they got ropes to go underneath to tie it off just so the, the ship wouldn't break apart. Wow. They were afraid it would get stuck on the sandbars of Sirtis. All right, um, can you go back to the map? All right, but remember where you were so we can come back to it. All right. So the map. All right, so here's, here's where they, they just kind of they kind of left Crete. And this, remember that squiggly line? That's where they were in the ocean with the hurricane. Okay? Now, what they were afraid of was that this wind would push them down to a place right here that you don't go to. All right? It, it, it was bad for sailing. And, and many stories had happened where ships had gotten caught and they got pushed there. And they even had legends of sea monsters taking over ships in this area. So they were afraid 
that they were going, that's why it says here, we, they were afraid it would get stuck on the sandbars of Sirtis. So they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took a very bad beating from the storm. You ever, you ever been in that situation? A storm so bad, felt like you just took a beating. The next day, the crew began to throw the ship's contents overboard. Now they're like, all right, let's just get rid of stuff. Let's lighten the load. So they're just throwing stuff overboard, right? On the third day, verse 19, they even threw the ship's gear overboard. I mean, like tools, necessary things. They were getting rid of the, the most precious cargo now at this point with their own hands. Verse 20, the sun and stars didn't appear for many days. The storm was terrible. So we gave up all hope of being saved. This is it. I mean, you had, it, we can't do it justice unless I were to get you out on a ship and get you out in a hurricane, and then you would really feel what they were feeling, that this was all. This was the end. There was no more hope. All of them felt that way. This is what Paul was facing. The men, verse 21, the men had not eaten for a long time. Paul decides, all right, I'm going to stand up. Got to say something. Paul, you know, you can just imagine it's like burning in his, in his heart. He just wants to speak and say something. So finally, he stood up in front of them and said, man, he said, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Have you ever had that person in your life? Go, I told you. I told you. You should have listened. I told you so. That was Paul. He said, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have avoided this harm and loss. But now I beg you to be brave. Not one of you will die. Only the ship will be destroyed. Now they're thinking, okay, we're going to all be saved. The, the boat's going down? How's that going to work? And, uh, and so then he says this, uh, verse 23, watch this. I belong to God and I serve him. Last night, his angel stood beside me and the angel said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must go on trial in front of Caesar. God has shown his grace by sparing the lives of all those sailing with you. Wow. You ever been in the storm in the most desperate of times and when you hear something about God, you're like, all right. Yes, because it's, you're facing the next step. And the next step is beyond this life. And now you're starting to think spiritually. And I'm, I'm imagining these men are like, okay, wow. Well, I'll believe it. I'll believe it now. Now that you said it. And then verse 25, Paul says, men, continue to be brave. I have faith in God. It will happen just as he told me. But we must run the ship onto the beach of some island. Wow, so now Paul is wanting to be captain. Paul's wanting to be captain of this ship and tell them what they need to do. And so now, I mean, it was like he told them and what happened, it, it came true, right? So now they're starting to believe, wow, maybe this guy is, is legitimate. Maybe we can believe this guy. Maybe we can trust him because we saw what he did say came true. And so I need, um, let's see, I, I'm going to pick on some people here. All right, I'm going to get, let's see, uh, Eli Arwen Brain, come on up here real quick. All right, come on, guys, come on, come on, come on. All right, and just so you're not alone, I'll do this with you, all right? So just like kind of find an area, find an area, but we're going to have a push-up contest. All right, here we go. Ready? Let's just, uh, let's just get down there. All right, find a spot. You know how to do push-ups. Ready? All right, ready? Push-up contest. All right, here we go. Ready, set, go. One, two, three. Come on, keep going, come on. How many can you do? Come on, keep going, keep going. Come on, keep going. Oh, man. It gets tough, doesn't it? Keep going as best as, best as you can. Come on, keep going. Oh, man, what do you want to do now? Oh, get that feeling in you. It's like, oh, can I do one more? All right, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Oh, man. All right, good job, guys. Good job. Good job. All right, give him a hand. Give him a hand. 
Whew, I'm going to pass out. All right, no. Um, so when you do this push-up contest, there is a point in which you're going, okay, that's the last one. Okay, maybe one more. Okay, that's the last one. Okay, I give up. I give up. I'm done, right? This was these men on that ship. We're done. We're done. They gave up all hope. And when they were at their bottom, who stands up? Paul. With a message from God. And I want you to understand, in the storms of life, this is what our tendency is. In the storms of life, we tend to give up on hope. We get, go ahead to the next one. We, we tend to give up in the storms. And we tend to get beat down. And when I say get beat down, you there? Here it is. We tend to give up on hope. We tend to get beat down. And that can be emotionally, that can be uh, mentally, that can be physically, it can be spiritually. We just get, feel like we're getting beaten down in the storm. That's what we tend to feel in the storm. We lose hope, and then guess what? We stop caring. You know what these guys are doing? Throwing stuff off the ship. Right, we're done. We don't need that. We don't need that. They stop caring. They stop caring about things. We sometimes tend to stop caring about people. Man, when the storm really wraps around us, this is our tendency. But we don't have to be like that. We don't have to be. Because remember, we just said it in the first point. God uses people to give us warnings. And he also uses them to give us encouragement. See, Paul's message now had some credit because what he said earlier came true. Sometimes people don't want to give you credit for sharing about Jesus. When you're living life for the Lord and they see you operating as a Christian your message becomes more credible, doesn't it? But if you're sharing Jesus and your life isn't showing like a Christian, you're not looking the same. Your, your, your message doesn't have that credit. So it's important. Here's the thing. God promises help when we go through the storms of life. God promises his help. I want you to understand this. If you go back into Scripture... All this was being told to Paul before he even got to the storm. Watch what it says in Acts 9. When, when, when Paul actually met Jesus, this is what it said. Ananias. Remember Ananias uh, or, or Saul? He, he, before Paul, he was Saul. He became blinded. And Ananias said, you need to go so that you can unblind him, make him see again. And Ananias, Ananias is like, are you sure? That guy's killing Christians. And then God gives Ananias a message. He says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. I've chosen this man to work for me. He will carry my name to those who aren't Jews and to their what? Kings. Caesar is the ultimate king. And Paul was going to share the message of Jesus to those people. Now, look even further. Acts 22, 21 says then the Lord said to me, this is Paul saying this, go, I will send you far away to people who are not Jews. And then last, Acts 23, 11, look at this. The next night, the Lord stood near Paul. He said, be brave. You have given witness about me in Jerusalem. You must do the same. Where? In Rome. So do you think God would have said, you're going to give witness to me in Rome and I'm going to take you out in the middle of the ocean and, and you're going to be lost at sea? No, because God had a promise. And when God makes promises, he follows through. He's faithful. He never gives up on a promise. And so this was promised to him. And so here it is. All right, 27, we're getting toward the end now. What happens to the ship? On the 14th night, do you guys realize this? 14 days out on that, that ocean. Storm. 14 days. The 14th night, we were still being driven across the Sea of Adria. 
About midnight, the sailors had a feeling that we were approaching land. They measured how deep the water was. They found out it was 120 feet deep. You know how you take soundings? You know, you drop a rope over with a, a weight on it and you can kind of get the idea of how, how many feet there are um, below, you know, below the ocean. So they saw that it was 120 feet deep. Then a short time later, they measured the water again. This time it was 90 feet deep. So they were getting closer to land, right? 29, verse 29, they were afraid we would crash against the rocks. So they dropped four anchors from the back of the ship. Look at this, I love it. They prayed that daylight would come. The sailors wanted to escape from the ship. So they, so they let the lifeboat down into the sea. They pretended they were going to lower some anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul spoke to the commander and, say, and, and the soldiers. He said, these men must stay with the ship. He said, if they don't, you can't be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and they let it drift away. You could imagine. Paul said the ship is going down. Maybe the lifeboat will be the one that saves us. But guess what? The soldiers cut the lifeboat and it's gone. So now what are they going to do? But Paul said, everybody's got to stay. Verse 33, just before dawn, Paul tried to get them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've wondered what would happen. You've gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I'm asking you to eat some food. You need it to live. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. Now, I imagine people like me were like, thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Yeah, I know. Okay. No, no hairs from the head. I got you. But he's saying that to him. He's like, you guys are going to be okay. Verse 35. After Paul said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God. And he did this where they all could see him. Then he broke it and began to eat. All of them were filled with hope, so they ate some food. There were how many? 276 people on that board, on that boat. They ate as much as they wanted. They needed to make the ship lighter. So they threw the rest of the grain into the sea. Guys, I want us to see this. In desperate times, our next point, let's put that up on the screen. In desperate times, we tend to fix what we can. We'll do what we can do. All right, we're going to work. All right, we're going to fix what we can. We can fix this. We can do it. And then we'll pray for help. But then sometimes our tendency also is to run away. What did all these prisoners want to do? They're like, we're out of here. We're getting on a lifeboat. We're gone. Sometimes we want to try and outrun our storms or fix it ourselves. Sometimes we'll pray. Sometimes we'll pray. Sometimes that's the only time we'll pray is in our storm. We won't pray in the preparation time. But I love, I love this next point because we can see encouragement from Christian brothers and sisters help us receive words of wisdom. Have you ever been in a situation in a storm and you're like, I just don't feel like God's there. I don't feel like he's answering my prayers. I don't think he, it, it just feels like he's not there. Sometimes that encouragement can be the voice from another brother or sister in Christ. And those encouragement, that encouragement, you'll see, they can be words of wisdom. You can hear hope for what's ahead. And you can hear reminders to thank God. Paul stood up with a piece of bread. He's like, thank you, God. And the waves are crashing and they're just, they're still just being driven. And thank you, God. In the middle of that storm, he stood up and gave thanks. That's a lesson to all of us. How do we deal with the storms? How do we prepare for the storms? Encouragement from Christian brothers and sisters are so important. All right, here, we're going to finish out with this last part. When daylight came, what happened? What happened to the ship, right? What happened? When daylight came, they saw a bay with a sandy beach. They didn't recognize the place. But they decided to run the ship onto the beach if they could. What did Paul say was going to have to happen? They're going to have to run, run the ship up there. So
So they cut the anchors loose and left them in the sea. At the same time, they untied the ropes that held the rudders. They lifted the sail at the front of the ship to the wind. Then they headed right for the beach. But the ship hit a sandbar, so the front of it got stuck and wouldn't move, and the back of the ship was broken to pieces by pounding waves. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners. Wait, what? They wanted to keep them from swimming away and escaping. You guys see that? Man. Now the soldiers have just survived this massive storm, and then now they're going to kill them. I mean, it's like, wait a minute. But they didn't want them to escape. What would that mean for soldiers? If their prisoners escaped, that means their life would be lost. They're dead, They're dead right? Because they didn't keep their prisoners. But the commander wanted to save Paul's life. So he kept the soldiers from carrying out their plan. And he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and swim to land. Guess, guess what? If you haven't eaten for 14 days, could you swim? No. Do you guys realize God used Paul to say, hey, eat some food. You're going to need it to live. Now they can swim. They got energy. Isn't that awesome how God does this? Designs all this along the way. And maybe you can see in your life little things God's done to bring you to exactly where you are today. So they, they swim to land. Verse 44, last verse. The rest were supposed to get there on boards or other pieces of the ship. Anybody not know how to swim in here? Anybody not know how to swim? Yeah, that's, this, was, this part's for you. They actually got boards and pieces of the ship so that they could actually reach the land safely. Wow. That's it. That's the end of the chapter. So what do we take from this? What do we take from this? I think we can sum it up just like this. Let me get, uh, let me get two chairs. Hold, hold that for a second. All right. So, uh, let me, uh, Mr. Phil, can I get you to come up? And um, Logan, why don't you come up? And... All right. You can pick either chair. All right, so we got two chairs here. All right. Now, you can say these guys look totally different, right? Uh, a little bigger, a little smaller. Why, right? Adult, you know, teenager, right? D different life uh, frames, right? Here's the thing I want you to see the contrast in. One chair is fear, and one chair is faith. Now, which one are you feeding? Which one are you feeding? Because guess what? If you're feeding fear, fear is going to get bigger and bigger and overwhelm you and overtake you, and you're feeding it. If you're feeding fear, guess what? Your faith will look smaller, and it'll just continue to just get weaker and weaker. But if you're feeding Let's say this is the faith chair now. If you're feeding faith, wow, your fear looks smaller, doesn't it? Right? But it's, what are you going to choose to feed? Which one? Because you can look and say, oh, man, Tim, you're telling me storms might be ahead of me? Yeah, I am. But what you're doing is then feeding the fear. You don't have to feed the fear. You can say, a storm's coming my way. All right, God, you're going through with, with me in this. I don't know what it's going to be like. It might be hard, but God, you're with me all the way. And I'm going to keep feeding my faith. I'm going to keep, keep, keep feeding the faith instead of feeding my fear. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Yeah. Do you guys see it? You can nurture fear. Now, what does the word nurture mean? Somebody give me a... a a definition. Just uh, what does nurturing mean? Nurture. Describing words. What's nurture? Help to, grow. Help to grow. Yeah. Taking care of. Right. Think of a little newborn baby. Helpless. Right. You're going to nurture that little baby. You're going to give it what it needs. Huh? 
attention. Yeah, you're atten- you can't just put a little newborn baby over here for a while. Right? You gotta, you gotta, it, it takes time, attention. And that baby whines and cries. You know it's in need of something. You don't know what sometimes. You're like, man, Lord, help me know what this thing needs. You can nurture fear. You ever thought about that? Now, we don't want to. We don't need, we don't want to do that. We shouldn't do that, but we do. But with God's strength and help and his promises, we can feed the faith. We can feed faith. So that that fear looks like nothing. And so that's what we take away from here. Think about right now something that causes you fear. Here's what I want you to do. Let's look at this. And you might want to take a picture of this right here because there's a lot on this. This next screen. Are you there for me? The next one. Yeah, about the fear. Um, think, think about something. Yeah, think about something. Yeah, right here. Okay, four things you can do. You think about your worries. Okay, think about those things that are worrying you. But then confess those to God. Because God does say don't worry. So that's a command. So we know we shouldn't worry. So then you confess it to God. And when you say confession, it, it, it's, a, it's kind of a, a word that means agreeing with God. When, when you confess it, you're saying, God, yeah, you're right. This is my worry. I agree. Yes, I'm confessing that to you. Yep, I'm caught. Right? You ever been caught? <laughs> and you're like, oh, man, I got caught doing something. Well, it's like confession is you saying, yeah, yeah, God, I'm agreeing with you that this is causing me to worry. So think about your worries. Confess those to God. Ask him to replace them. Now, everybody in here, what I don't want you to do is think about the number eight. All right? Don't think about the number eight. Whatever you do, don't think about the number eight. Are Are you thinking about the number eight? Don't think about the number eight. What did you do? Think about another number. Did you replace it? Did you replace it with like the number nine or the number 12 or something like that, right? You can replace that. Ask God to help you replace that worry with something different. Ask him to replace them. And then live out your faith, not your fear, live out your faith by doing this. Prayer, God's word, gratitude, which means thanking God, thanking him, and worshiping him. Those are four things that you can do to feed the faith, nurture the faith. So we don't have to worry about storms. I mean, Paul, I couldn't imagine going through the waves knowing I got to get to Rome. I got to get to Rome. God told me I'm going to get to Rome. I'm going to get to Rome, right? He replaced those fears staring death in the face. He's like, I got to get to Rome. I got to get to Rome. Yeah, that's what God said. I'm just telling you what God said. I got to get to Rome. So he replaced that thought with the promise that God had for him. What's the promise? Psalm 46, 1. God is our place of safety. He gives us strength. Right? That's, is our verse back up here? Can we put our verse back up there? The verse is, God is our place of safety. He gives us strength. He's always there to help us in times of trouble. Now, he might be quiet, but he's always there. He's always there. What was our central idea? Paul's life is filled with occasions when God helped him through difficult times. Guess what? You can put your name in there. You can put your name in there. Tim's life is filled with occasions when God helped him through difficult times. You put your name in there. Will you choose, here's the challenge, will you choose to remember that God is with you and will help you when you go through difficult times? That's it today. I want you to understand, coming out of a, you're in the storm, you're coming out of the storm, about to head into one. And and when that hurricane was coming, did we not get some preparations going? We start to prepare, right? Well, if you're in the time where you came out of the storm and and you're not in a storm right now, maybe it's preparation time. It's preparation time for you. Maybe you're in the storm right now and you just needed to hear an encouraging word. Well, guess what? Paul has one. 
Paul has an encouraging word for you. You don't have to feed that fear. Amen? That's it. That's it. Um, we're going to end today. Um, I think we're going to end in two songs. Now, while this song is playing, it's going to come up on the screens. The words will be up there. I just want you to take the, the, this message in. And then the praise band is going to lead us in, uh, in another song. And we're going to end today on a celebration. Because storms don't have to bring us down. They can show us how faithful God is to us. And we can celebrate Him in that. Um, and so I pray that you go out of here encouraged, ready to face anything that's going to come your way. Because greater is He who's in you than He who's in the world. And remember, like we said last week, when we go out these doors, that's our mission field. That's our mission field. Right? We're all missionaries. Wherever we go, we carry the name of Jesus to every, everyone. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me. In the eye of the storm When the solid ground is falling out From underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see When I realize I've been sold out By my friends and my family I can feel the rain reminding me in the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith. See the future I picture slowly fade away And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face I find my peace in Jesus' name In the eye of the storm, you remain in control In the middle of the war, you guard my soul says I've only got a few months left it's like a bitter pill I'm swallowing I can barely take a breath and when addiction steals my baby girl and there's nothing I can do my only hope is to trust you I trust you Lord in the eye of the soul Before we sing, uh, before we sing that song, as they're coming, um, let me just see. Uh, Wes, would you lead us in prayer? Um, just uh, and then we'll go out singing uh, in this song. But uh, 
I'm praying um, for you this week uh, that if you're in the storm, you'll just remember he's with you all the way. And, um, and if you're not in the storm, we'll just be preparing, right? We'll be preparing. So uh, uh, let me give um, Wes this mic here. All right. And then after Wes prays, uh, we'll do our final song and you can give your offering after that. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we just like to ask you for, we just like to thank you for your kindness, for your love, for your mercy, Lord, for the gift of salvation, and for just bringing all of us here safely to worship and praise you, Lord. We ask that we go throughout this day and throughout the rest of the week, that the words that were spoken to us today, that they may just go with us and be a light, be a light in our lives, not just to us, but to our family and friends, Lord. That no matter what storm we may go through or whatever thing, but a big or small, that you may just be there for us, Lord, and that you may just help to see that we may not have to worry, and that you are in control of everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.